I'm pleased and honored today to briefly introduce to you two Milwaukee women, one of whom is our speaker. The other is the individual in whose honor this address is given. Zabel Malkasian was a longtime member of the Wamatosa League, and then when we joined with uh, two leagues together to become the Milwaukee County League, uh, Zabel was present. She basically was a determined league member who without fail kept affirmative action and women's place in government foremost in all conversations. I would have trouble getting her to switch to a natural resources topic now. <laughs> At any rate, her personal mission and leadership in State League was advocacy on behalf of the actual value of non and low wage earners in every household across this state. She worked doggedly for marital property reform and rejoiced at all kinds of league meetings when it became the law of the state. Given Zabel's legacy, it's quite appropriate that today's speaker actually knew Zabel as a little girl. <laughs> Her mother, uh, Dr. McBride's mother, was a Wauwatosa League member and was taken along to meetings in the Wauwatosa League and got to know Zabel as a tot. So, uh, Dr. Genevieve McBride is both a Milwaukee native and author of publications spanning women's history from pre-settlement to the present. Dr. McBride, McBride is pre uh, Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and she's an editor of an anthology called with Women's Wisconsin from Native Matriarchies to the New Millennium. That anthology opens up four years ago with the story of a female Ho-Chunk chief, something we have yet to achieve in modern day with a female governor in the state. So today, Dr. McBride will discuss on Wisconsin women working for their rights from suffrage from settlement to suffrage. Please welcome Dr. McBride. Thank you so much. Thank you, Louise. We go ba way back, thanks to her husband and I being colleagues at UWM. But thank you all for the honor of inviting me to celebrate with you our centennial as the first state to officially ratify the 19th Amendment 100 years ago this week in Wisconsin. <laughs> it's been decades since I met some of you, since publication of this research for my first book. When I wasn't a tot, but I was a lot younger. Um, this, today's talk is this book. So I look forward to talking with you again about the work that women called the century of struggle. When we have hard days, think of a century of struggle. Okay. It was a century in the East at least. However, in this state, our story today started with statehood in 1848, a pivotal year in the history of Wisconsin and in the histories of women here and worldwide. Eastern women who had migrated here had brought west their American dream of full citizenship, which actually had existed here for our first women, the Native American women, when Wisconsin, as Louise mentioned, actually had a woman chief 400 years ago, Hopakawakao of the Ho-Chunk, which means the glory of the morning. Isn't that a wonderful status? Wonderful way to start my second book with her. And as she mentioned, we haven't accomplished that since. Um, they and French women also had many rights under French law for the French Canadian women, like my grandmother for whom I'm named, and the Métis women, Métis meaning mixed, women here like Josette Vaux Junot, the founding mother of Milwaukee. But by then, women here had lost their property rights because their lands were lost to the British and then to the newcomer Americans, whose Declaration of Independence had asserted only that all men were created equal. However, women 
early on held hope that courts would rule for their rights under the Constitution. The Constitution which made no mention of gender then. Nor would the Wisconsin Constitution when we won statehood in 1848 at last. Two years before, in 1846, the voters of this territory, the men, had rejected a first draft of a state constitution and had deferred statehood after a divisive debate on reforms including women's rights. That had doomed our first attempt at statehood. As historian Louise Phelps Kellogg wrote, and I quote, that debate had raged for several days among men, many of whom were advanced thinkers on social questions. <laughs> However, on the subject of suffrage for freedmen or former slaves, a less advanced speaker among the men here suggested the result of such foolishness. As she writes, he had the reputation of being a wag, he was Irish, and he raised the specter of woman suffrage for comic relief. So, as she wrote, and I quote, there was no serious consideration of woman suffrage, but only ridicule to show how preposterous it was. But because married women's property rights did survive debate for our first try at statehood, the document failed. So, our second attempt at a constitution included no such foolishness as any rights for women and minorities in 1848, when women had waited 72 years since the Declaration of Independence to win our own, and they would wait 72 years more. <coughs> Elsewhere, a few months later in 1848 and a few Great Lakes to the east in upstate New York, the women's rights movement was born with the first women's rights convention in the world. Women there in Seneca Falls, including Elizabeth Cady Stanton, organized the convention, and she drafted a document modeled on men's declaration to start the next revolution for women. As she wrote, and I quote from her historic Declaration of Sentiments at Seneca Falls, women could anticipate no small amount of misconception, misrepresentation, and ridicule for decades to come until they would win the 19th Amendment to the Constitution at last, and at least as her historic document listed dozens of rights to be won for women, and some are not yet won today. Now that the first state to ratify that amendment would be Wisconsin is a complex story. <laughs> that women's rights and freed men's suffrage and temperance too were on Wisconsin's political agenda even before statehood seemed promising. However, that none of these reforms was adopted here in 1848 suggests the magnitude of the reform campaigns to follow for the 13th, 14th, 15th, 18th, and then 19th amendments, which were so numbered because the last one to be won for woman suffrage would be the reform to be hardest fought and subjected to the most misrepresentation and ridicule, especially in Wisconsin. First, for nearly two decades, from Seneca Falls through the Civil War, those suffragists deferred their own cause for the urgency of ending slavery and the urgent needs of men in wartime. But here and nationwide, women cared for all of the casualties of war through their abolition societies and then their soldiers aid societies and then in the north their national sanitary commission women cared for war widows and war orphans as well as wounded men in this state in my Milwaukee women raised funds for supplies and for a Water Street storefront where they cared for more than 30,000 men wounded during the war and for years afterward until the federal government finally took responsibility and also took the land that Milwaukee women bought from their bake sales and craft fairs for the first federal veterans hospital and soldiers home in the country in Milwaukee. Women had deferred their own cause with the understanding that the men in reform would work for universal suffrage, meaning for women as well as for freed men, once abolition was won. So women had helped to found the Equal Rights Association. At its meeting in 1866 in New York City, men shared the podium with Katie Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, and a movement newcomer making her first stand for woman suffrage. A decade later, the Reverend Olympia Brown would move to this state. 
And more than five decades later, she would be the only one of those women on the podium in 1866, the only survivor of what was called the first generation of suffrage leaders who would live to vote in 1920. The struggle would take so long because the same men in reform who had sought women's support for the 14th and 15th Amendments for citizenship and voting rights for freedmen, then actually wrote women out of the Constitution with, for the first time, the inclusion of gender in the Constitution with the word male in those amendments in 1868. That ended early suffragists' hope for resort to the courts. Now a new constitutional amendment was needed. So, in 1869, Anthony and Katie Stanton went on tour to the West to organize women. They came to our first statewide woman suffrage convention, organized by women in Milwaukee, a comparative mecca for the few women in Wisconsin in the professions then, including a minister, a law student, and an editor and publisher, until men here formed the state's first union to boycott her newspaper and shut it down. The Deutsche Frauen Zeitung was German. Another organizer was the third woman graduate from the first medical school for women, because men wouldn't let them in theirs, and the, the first woman physician in Wisconsin. However, men in our medical society here denied her admission for a decade. But before the year's end, she became a member by marrying its president. <laughs> first, Dr. Laura Ross Wolcott became the first president of the Wisconsin Woman Suffrage Association, which would survive by that name for 50 years to win the 19th Amendment ratification. And it survives today, as you know, because your predecessor organization began that day in Milwaukee City Hall. Yeah. And I want a historical landmark sign there. <laughs> a standing room. Peggy will hear about that on Monday. I'm talking at the Milwaukee <laughs> County Historical Society. A standing room only crowd met in Milwaukee City Hall to see Anthony, Katie Stanton, and other women actually speak in public. <laughs> One in the crowd be later became a well-known editor who then wrote, and I quote, that as a lad, he had strayed into the convention but had to flatten himself against the wall because the chairs all were occupied mostly by ladies. Now, gentlemen of the press were present because the Milwaukee Sentinel published the proceedings and another newspaper in my city noted the, noted the event by editorially refuting public <coughs> suspicion that the end, event drew, as the editor wrote, and I quote, only that class of women known as strong-minded. <laughs> and in their own suffrage newspaper, called The Revolution, Katie Stanton and Anthony wrote, and I quote, that Milwaukee papers teem with accounts, most often friendly, even if entirely opposed to the object under consideration, as all of the newspapers were. Now, the women's wrote, report, report included coverage also of the reception in Madison, where they went next and where Anthony became the first woman to speak in our state capitol. She was to speak in support of a bill for limited school suffrage only. But some legislators, uh, OK, I'm going to hit these guys a lot in this talk, OK? <laughs> some of our legislators, in all their wisdom, had brought up the bill early to defeat it the day before. Madison was not friendly for women, as Ross Wolcott wrote in the first state report for Katie Stanton and Anthony's first volume of their monumental six-volume collection called The History of Woman Suffrage. Among many items in her report, Ross Wolcott wrote about the UW, which was to have been coeducational by then, but regents and legislators had relegated women students to a separate, less funded, and inferior female college. As she wrote, and I quote, that was one of many petty ways in which girls can be defrauded of their rights to a thorough education by narrow and bigoted men entrusted with a little brief authority. <laughs> Some men still read that as a job description, it seemed, when I was 
when I was turned down for tenure <laughs> after this book. It's hot, it's hot. In 1869, suffragists at least could look elsewhere for progress. In the West, Wyoming was the first state with full woman suffrage, all elections, all the time, none of this school suffrage stuff. And in the East, Matilda Francisca Geisler Annika of Milwaukee addressed the major reform group, the Equal Rights Association. As an immigrant who had fled here for freedom from the German Revolution, she pleaded in English and in German with the men who were writing women out of the Constitution. She said, don't exclude us. Don't exclude half of the human family from the ballot box, which is the people's holy palladium. Then the men called the women imprudent. And Annika replied that whether it be prudent to enfranchise women is not the question, only whether it be right. <laughs> but when the equal rights reformers refused to support equal suffrage, Women realized that they needed an organization and an amendment of their own. So Annika stayed east to represent our state when Anthony and Katie Stanton founded the first woman suffrage organization that year in 1869, the one that would have outlived them to win the 19th Amendment more than half a century later. Now elsewhere and in Wisconsin for the next 50 years, I'm covering a lot, of, a lot of the book here. From 1869 to 1919, women without the vote were active in politics at the forefront of reform campaigns, such as the Women's Temperance Crusade of 1873 and 74. Indeed, I was surprised to find in my research for this book that the first crusade was in this state. The other books don't tell you that. But where else would a temperance campaign be needed more? <laughs> The movement spread from here to enlist 150,000 women in every state and territory who then founded the world's largest women's organization, the WCTU, whose president by 1880 was a suffragist, Frances Willard from Janesville. And another leader, still in Janesville, was Lavinia Goodell, the first woman lawyer in this state, the only state where a state bar denied admission to a woman twice when our chief justice denounced her as a traitor to her sex. <laughs> By 1880, when she finally won her fight for admission to the state bar, we lost an important leader. Goodell could not go to court. She died three weeks later at the age of 40. <laughs> but a resurgence of suffragism also arose in this state in 1880 as Anthony and Katie Stanton returned to lobby for a law allowing women to run for school superintendent seats. Women won it. At the same time, they lost a law allowing them to vote for themselves. Wisconsin. <laughs> then came a battle for the ballot that would win and lose even limited suffrage here. That first woman suffrage referendum in this state was led by the organization founded in 1869. By then, it's led by Olympia Brown. And women in 1886 actually won the majority of voters, the men, who still were the only voters in this state. Had that referendum result stood in 1886, Wisconsin would have been the second state with woman suffrage. Instead, we would be tied for last decades later. Why? Because in 1888, women had had to take the battle for that bill to the state Supreme Court. They lost a long and costly battle. When the court ruled that legislators first had to fix a little flaw in the law, which was caused by the men's revision of the women's careful wording. Somehow, our state legislators would not find a way to fix that little flaw in the law for 15 years. In the interim, the loss set back the state suffrage movement, but so did its leader, Olympia Brown. By then she was bitter and inactive, but she refused to step down. So another movement of women would take leadership of the cause in the 1890s, if they did so more quietly, because they were called the ladies of the clubs. <laughs> 
<laughs> First came local civic federations under women's motto of municipal housekeeping. <laughs> then a state federation led by influential women like Belle Case LaFollette, her spouse's speechwriter. Indeed, when I found her speech to club women in 1896 at their first state federation convention, it seemed familiar. Her spouse would repeat it, almost word for word, in his famous inaugural speech as governor that set forth the progressive movement agenda four years later, the years that he called when we were governor. So, in a new century, club women led our state suffrage movement because they were led there by their new state president. <coughs> Theodora Winton Yeomans of Waukesha was a pioneering journalist who had covered women's causes since the 1880s at the newspaper there that was known as the Progressive Mouthpiece. She now led club women lobbying to win back at least part of the law that was lost after the 1886 state referendum. And they won, club women won, for us limited school suffrage enacted in 1902, meaning they could vote in school-related elections with a separate ballot box and separate ballots. <laughs> now here and across the country, the middle-aged, middle-class ladies of the clubs became called the second generation of suffragists. They came into the campaign in the millions by the end. They were motivated by frustration with men's intransigence towards civic-minded women. As your first president put it, club woman Jessie Jack Hooper of Oshkosh, she said that she became a suffragist because women without the vote had, as she wrote, and I quote, only a teaspoon to try to move men toward progress when only a steam shovel would do. <laughs> But they also became frustrated with Olympia Brown. So club woman Ada James of Richland Center started a new suffrage organization. And she recruited Winton Yeomans to publicize another state referendum. But results of this state's second suffrage referendum would make Wisconsin infamous among women. This time in 1912 when state after state went for women's suffrage, Wisconsin, women, Wisconsin men voted against it two to one, as late as 1912. Reasons for the resounding failure of the referendum were many, most of them owing to men's corrupt maneuvers from liquor lobby, like liquor lobby bribery <laughs> in the state where its lobbying had been begun by the original Milwaukee Brewers, to a state attorney general's last minute order for separate <coughs> pink referendum ballots. <laughs> but above all, as a suffragist here wrote, and I quote, the last thing a man becomes progressive about in Wisconsin is the activities of his own wife. However, 1912 was a turning point nationwide, as women in other states did win suffrage. And even here, women created awareness of their cause, which is a first step in any campaign, in, in ways that astonished politicians, press, and the public. From 1911 on, the once well-mannered Wisconsin club women were in the news, owing to Winton Yeomans, with her weekly suffrage column that she syndicated statewide. Her coverage for decades before, as well as during that campaign and since, and the work of other women journalists before her here, comprised thousands of articles on microfilm for the record that made my research possible. I read of tactics called suffrage stunts, never seen in this state, from parades in colorful yellow and purple sashes to the new movies in storefronts, or as they also were called, photo plays, to flyers in immigrants' languages dropped by the new flying machines. And at a time when, when cars still were rare on our state roads, Buffalo Bill Cody carried a suffrage banner as he rode his horse into Green Bay. <laughs> but women careened from town to town in what they called motor tours in cars covered in suffrage, covered in suffrage colors. <laughs> 
<laughs> Belle Case LaFollette came back to the state to speak from a back seat. Another woman was at a loss for words, but as Winton Yeomans wrote, and I quote, she could drive an auto and play a cornet. So. <laughs> and after her own motor tour, Winton Yeomans wrote, and I quote, that the native badger experienced the destructive shock of seeing a woman stand up in an automobile on a street corner and plead for her political freedom. But colorful tactics could not substitute for cohesive strategy, and another turning point came as women realized that competing state suffrage organizations, Ada James's new one and the old one, they needed to merge and with new leadership. They elected Winton Yeomans as the last president of our state suffragist. Fortunately, she continued her column to chronicle a time of immense energy but immense conflict within the movement here and the country, but nowhere more than Wisconsin as the most Germanic state in the country. The European war came here in 1914, sooner than in any state. Some suffragists here were immigrants, such as Sophie Gooden of Oshkosh. Others had German heritage, such as Maida Schlichtenberger of Milwaukee. And the federal government <coughs> persecuted her immigrant husband, who was denied his seat in Congress and denied my city representation for their newspaper's stance for neutrality. While Belle Case LaFollette's spouse faced, faced impeachment in the Senate for his anti-war activism. And then, even as our state suffragists reunited, two newcomers to the national movement split it apart. Alice Paul and Lucy Burns trained in the militant British movement and returned as what Europeans called suffragettes. But a side note, that's a diminutive. And it's a gendered term. So it was not used by most women here. The media don't get that. But women here welcomed male support, so they used the term suffragist. Then, after years of conflict with the older organization, Paul and Burns left to start their National Woman's Party in 1915, just as the older organization was on the cusp of a resurgence when Anthony's Choice's successor returned to its presidency. Carrie Chapman Catt, born in Ripon, was a brilliant strategist who just had led a massive effort that won woman suffrage in New York State, the most populous state then, in time for the presidential election. Catt would enlist suffragists in support of President Wilson's war to win his support of suffrage. But that lost the support of anti-war women. In Wisconsin, octogenarian Olympia Brown publicly repudiated Catt and Winton Yeomans and quit the state or suffrage organization that she long had led, while James and Berger and LaFollette also again quit the older state suffrage organization for the new one. Their departures were a public and personal blow to Yeomans, but the older state organization may have benefited. She lost her most divisive members and gained a second in command as the first vice president, Jesse Jack Hooper, an experienced and effective lobbyist. Suffragists nationwide also split over the National Woman's Party tactics, which were taken from the British movement, such as when they picketed the White House for suffrage against Wilson. But he claimed that they were protesting against the war. So he had Paul and Burns and dozens of women imprisoned and tortured. And that overreach by the White House won sympathy for the women's cause. So Wilson finally had to meet with somebody from the suffrage movement. And now he picks the more moderate suffrage leader compared to Paul and Burns. At least so it seemed. But Kat reminded Wilson that millions of women in suffrage states had voted in 1916. They even had elected the first woman in Congress. And then, as most suffragists continued with Kat's plan to prove their patriotism, they won more states to become a constituency sufficient for, to put political pressure on the president and Congress. So at last, at least congressmen and a congresswoman in the House, all up for re-election, saw a political purpose in passing the Susan B. Anthony Amendment as it was known for its author before it became numbered. It had been introduced almost half a century before, 
for our national centennial in 1876. Somehow, it never came out of committee in Congress until 1918 when Cat called women to Washington to lobby their congressmen, while others did so in their home states. So, Winton Yeomans went to Washington, while Jesse Jack Hooper stayed in this state to lobby across wintry Wisconsin. In their moving correspondence that is cited in the classic history of the national movement, Hooper wrote, and I quote, I was frightfully tired from nervous and physical exhaustion as I traveled over a good deal of the districts, not making public speeches, but seeing the men who were politically prominent. Some days I got up at 5.30, took an electric train, and did not get home until midnight, talking out with the question with six to eight men and going from office to office all during the day. I worked up until the last moment <coughs> until I knew nothing more could reach Washington, and then I gave it up. However, Hooper said she was not complaining and wrote, I would do it all again to get the results even if I were in bed for six months. She said that she had been sure of six votes and hoped for seven of the 11 in Wisconsin. However, Hooper snared one more for eight votes from this state toward the total that with the two-thirds required for constitutional amendments passed the House by one vote. But many histories credit four men in Congress who came from sick beds, whether their own or their wives. One woman ill in bed told her husband to go to Washington. He would return for her funeral. First, from the House galleries, though, he heard a familiar hymn, and I heard it at 9 o'clock last night, the beautiful bells here. As Winton Yeomans wrote, she and others were seated behind the sign that said, Mrs. Katz Ladies, in the house galleries, and they celebrated with a spontaneous hymn sing of the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. However, the house vote was only the first hurdle. Katz made clear to the White House that the suffrage states, with more than 15 million women voters now, neared a majority in the Electoral College. So, Wilson finally was forced to go to the Senate to appeal for support of woman suffrage. But the Senate refused to act. So the bill would have to go back to the House, come back up in the new biennium, when the Senate again would defeat the bill twice, even as late as February 1919 by one vote. In the interim, President Wilson asked suffragists to be patient after a century of struggle. In Wisconsin, women lost patience with our state legislators. When as late as 1919, the men in Madison rejected a bill for full suffrage and backslid to go to a bill for only presidential suffrage so that they would not face women voters in their own legislative races. <laughs> Those bills also caused Kat to lose patience with our state. She had called Wisconsin hopeless. She had ordered support only of other states' campaigns that could win to add to the Electoral College count. The women here were bringing up these bills. But our state legislators' compromise would become moot anyway by May. Wilson called Congress back for a special session. Kat called women back to the Capitol. This time, both Winton Yeomans and Jesse Jack Hooper watched from the House galleries as the same bill passed a year before in 1918 passed again. But this time, as Winton Yeomans reported to her readers, women held their hallelujahs. She wrote, and I quote, there was no excitement, no jubilee on our side. The fight had been so long, the victory had come so gradually that it was difficult to grasp. We filed out, smiling quietly at each other, and that was all. And that is one of the saddest of the thousands of accounts that I read by women who had earned the right to rejoice, but by then they were only wearied by their long fight for suffrage. Two weeks later, 
in June 1919 at last. Suffragists were exultant when the Senate passed the 19th Amendment by two votes and sent it to the states. This time, Hooper had stayed in Washington to lobby to the last minute, while Winton Yeomans had raced back to Wisconsin to get back to work on the third step for ratification, because even then, the men in our legislature, we became accustomed to this, state employees, <coughs> they simply couldn't complete their work in time in Madison, so they were still in session. <laughs> and so that Wisconsin, for so long, the despair of suffragists, would become the envy of the movement at the end, owed in part to luck, but primarily to women's planning. Now, admittedly, a yen for glory was a factor for suffragists. As Winton Yeomans wrote, and I quote, we of Wisconsin have been extremely ambitious to secure for our state the honor of first state to ratify. But other states have similar ambitions. <laughs> and Illinois has set her heart on being first. <laughs> Those were fighting words in her newspaper for Wisconsinites as she slyly singled out the state that could raise the competitive spirit in the men in Madison. So to give them their due, the historic ratification here also was owing to men and their cynical political posturing. In one of the most laggard of states, our legislators now rushed to ratify. <laughs> and a few honest men in our legislature admitted to the press why they changed the votes. They only voted for ratification in case it won elsewhere because then they would look good to women voters. <laughs> but because the men in Madison still had to debate the issue for almost an hour, while legislators, legislatures also were in session in Illinois and Michigan, the men in the state to ourselves actually acted first. They got the word in Madison. You blew it. But Illinois erred in the wording, and their document would be rejected in Washington and have to be redone days later. <laughs> However, in Wisconsin, as Winton Yeomans wrote, women already had anticipated every detail they had learned in that century, down to the legal language and it passed with only three dissenting votes from our state legislators. <coughs> Women even had lined up a courier ready to carry the ratification document to Washington. The father of Ada James, he was 76 years old and retired from the legislature where he had sponsored the 1912 referendum bill and her uncle had sponsored the 1886 referendum bill. Now, Ada James' father was in Madison for the day for reunion of Civil War veterans. So, as Ada later wrote, he had to commandeer her travel bag to race by train, car, and even on foot to Washington, where women had alerted Wisconsin Senator Irvine Lenroot, a longtime supporter of suffrage. His staff raced David James and our ratification document to the State Department. But then, Wisconsin women had to wait weeks for word until Winton Yeomans could report to her readers that the Secretary of State had sent official verification that on June 10, 1919, Wisconsin at last had earned first place in women's history. <laughs> now that's a paradoxical place for one of the last states still, still without full suffrage then. That the 19th Amendment was ratified first in Wisconsin was not a coup for a state famed for progressive reform. I read that in all the state history books. So that, what I found was not at all what I expected to find when I began my book. But as most media and reviewers here ignored about the book, my evidence argues that this was not and is not a progressive state for women, for whom that was a myth even then. Indeed, even in 1912, when progressivism was at its peak in Wisconsin, men here had voted down suffrage two to one because when progressivism began in this state two decades before, after the first referendum, women here already had begun to be fall behind women elsewhere. And by many measures, we still are today, as you probably know. Instead, 
The struggle had lasted so long in this state that women still were organized in Wisconsin, well after women in suffrage states for as much as half a century had disbanded, gotten back to their lives. So they had to reorganize for ratification. So it's the intransigence of men here met by the women who remained organized here. That's the reason why Wisconsin made history. The race to ratify the 19th Amendment also suggests that the honor was easily won. So it's important to remember that it first passed by only a few votes in the House and at the end by only a few in the Senate and in that in this state our legislators still were debating a bill for another referendum that day and for only partial suffrage, a bill that based on women's history here might not have been won. After all, Every other state suffrage organization that I could find had what women called suffrage hymns. Ours was the only state with a suffrage fight song. <laughs> to the tune of On Wisconsin. It's the frontispiece of the book. Its author wrote, and I quote Winton Yeomans again, full suffrage was won in this, won in this state only when, at length, it was taken out of the hands of the male voters of Wisconsin by the federal government. And that was more than a year away, as women here and elsewhere could not know when or even whether the last ratification would be won. With 35 more states required for ratification, she warned her readers, victory was not inevitable. And then ratification stalled, short by one state for months. And even when the last state ratified, it was won again by only one vote from a young first-term legislator who found the courage to withstand political corruption and bribery when that morning he found in his pocket a note from his mother who wrote, and I quote, be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat. <laughs> he would be defeated for re-election and never run for office again. And even a week and a day later, when the 19th Amendment became law at last on August 26, 1920, there was work yet to be done to disprove the perennial cliche that women didn't really want the vote. As Winton Yeomans wrote, and I quote, Legislation now has done all for us that it could do. Now the task was to teach women to turn out at the polls. Not that she had subscribed to the argument that women with the ballot would affect great change. Instead, she wrote, and I quote, if women vote, they often will vote ignorantly or angrily or selfishly, as men do. <laughs> and women have the same right as men to commit these errors and to learn by them. However, they did have hope in us. So Kat took a crucial step in any successful public opinion campaign, which is to maintain support once won. After all, they long had seen laws that they had won get lost again. And the 18th Amendment, of course, would be repealed. And repeal the campaigns against the 19th Amendment were immediately underway. So at their national convention in Chicago, in 1920, on the centennial of Susan B. Anthony's birthday, which I celebrate every year, and it had been celebrated by women for decades then and since, as you heard today, her successor vowed to continue the work begun by Anthony and Katie Stanton more than 50 years before. And so, Kat renamed the National American Woman Suffrage Association as the League of Women Voters. Less than a week later, in the Milwaukee Public Library, we need another historical landmark sign, as Winton Yeomans wrote, and I quote, our state's suffragists met in the city where women long gone also had founded the state organization in 1869. So she wrote, and I quote, it was with a sense of sadness and yet great rejoicing that the older organization was dissolved and succeeded by the Wisconsin League of Women Voters. And at last, she said, the woman's suffrage movement in its truest meaning commenced. The work continued with little change in leadership nationally and in the state where Winton Yeomans and Hooper swapped titles, not tasks. As league president, Hooper continued to lead lobbying efforts while Winton Yeomans, as first vice president, managed a new public opinion campaign which she called, in the new name of her newspaper column too, Good Citizenship for Women. She also took on another task as a historian, the task of every state president as they left office, which was to leave a legacy of their state reports for the volumes of 
the six volume collection called The History of Woman Suffrage on how women made history. She also submitted it for publication in our State Historical Society's magazine as a record for us to read, and you can find it online, in the hope that we would learn from our past the world she knew would not. Nor have we always heeded our foremothers and their lessons from the past on the hard work that it took to make history here. As Winton Yeomans wrote, and I quote, many women and men helped in the long struggle, but it was a burning flame in the souls of a little group of women which lighted the way because they had a profound conviction that suffrage was fundamentally right and absolutely necessary. And so, she concluded, while the careless world will think that woman suffrage just happened, that it was in the air, we know that the changes in the opinions of society which made it possible are the result only of ceaseless, unremitting toil. That's still your job description, right? Yeah. So. Yet as she feared a generation of women would forget their heritage and the legacy of lessons handed down through the decades by our foremothers, or as they sang, their, for, uh, for us, their daughters' daughters. Her history and those of thousands of other women whose words fill those six volumes of the record begun by Katie Stanton and Anthony, those were not rediscovered for another half century until the modern woman's movement when my generation had to re relearn how to win change and as the suffragists also saying, not for ourselves alone, but for all women. Because we had to relearn, as they knew well, that as long as any woman is denied her rights, all women may be next. Yeah. Look at that list. We also had to relearn that suffrage was necessary but not sufficient, as it was only a first step to win other and equal rights. Suffragists in 1920 knew this as they continued to work for women's rights in marriage and divorce and child custody, in education and income, even the basic right to jury service to be judged by juries of our peers. And many more rights delineated in that Declaration of Sentiments in 1848, but some again still not ours today, without another constitutional amendment, the ERA. May I live to see it, I begin to wonder. However, in 1921, Wisconsin again had been the first state with a state ERA, a historic law that made headlines nationwide as the first Bill of Rights for Women. But few of us know of it and what became of it in our legislature, unfortunately, and how what happened to our ERA here reshaped the national ERA that women suffragists would introduce in 1923. That's all another story that I also researched and wrote for another book. <laughs> but that is for another day. For today, in the words of our first foremothers in Wisconsin, thank you again for inviting me to honor with you our foremothers, but especially your foremothers in the League of Women Voters, as we celebrate this centennial of your historic ratification the first ratification of the 19th Amendment. And as we all look forward to nationwide celebrations of the amendment's centennial in the forthcoming year. <laughs>